So the last couple of weeks, I know Janelle's taught a couple times, you had Sarah teach. We've been in the introduction of the Sermon on the Mount. And today we're going to start moving into the actual body of the Sermon on the Mount. But in the introduction, um, we've looked at the who, right? Who this sermon is directed towards. And um, Janelle taught so beautifully last week. Sarah taught, you know, on, on the blessings. Um, but who this, this sermon is directed towards is, is us, right? Is the disciple, is the people who, who Jesus was speaking to in that time. So those of us who are following Jesus and in this context of Matthew 5, it was the Jewish people of his day. And so... For us, we're going we're gonna to be referring to ourselves as what Janelle just taught on last week. This, the salt and the light, a city on a hill. Um, we go through that whole list, you know, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Okay, so that is the who, all right? Today, as we move into the body of this text, we're going to be looking at the how. How do we become those things? How do we, the people of God, become the salt and the light? How do we become a city on a hill? How do, we, how do we take hold of all those blessings that we see listed there? And Jesus is going to begin to answer that question of how we do that with the text that we are looking at today. So, in Matthew five seventeen through 48... Um, as, we, as we sort of break this down, I want us to keep a couple things in mind. First of all, this idea of radical righteousness um, is defined in our homework. Righteousness was defined as, I, want, I think I wrote it down here, right living according to God's standards, which results in doing right by others. This, is, this perfectly sums up what we're looking at today. Right living according to God's standards, and, and out of that, we do right by others. So according to, to this definition, if I want to live a righteous life, if I want to step into the, to what God has called us to, this radical, righteous lifestyle, I have to align myself with God's word and with God's standard first. That's my first step. And then out of that, out of that alignment with God, my, that obedience to what he's called us to, out of that, there is this natural outflow of blessing and life to those around me. And so it's this twofold idea, right? It's not, I think so often when we think of righteousness, at least for me, I think of just, if, hey, me and God are good, I'm good. And we see Jesus very clearly taking that idea apart in this passage, that we, we are not an island. I cannot just have a one way, just this is, this is all that there is. If I, if I am receiving from the Lord, then there is a call on my life as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, to bless those around me with what I've received from him. So this radically righteous life, it looks like us aligning ourselves with God's standard and then being a blessing to those around us. And basically what it boils down to is God cares about how we treat each other. He cares deeply about how we treat one another. And we, we can see that from all the way back in the garden, we see this, this design for us to live in community and to live in unity. And so because of the fall, because of sin, that's been disrupted and that's been broken. And here in this passage, we're going to see Jesus bringing some of that back into alignment for us and showing us how to rightly and righteously live. So this passage starts out in verse 17. Um, Jesus makes this statement. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So what does this have to do with living a righteous life? Well, Jesus is going to use six examples in the, in the following text. And he's going to be mainly pulling from the law, which was the only recorded word of God that the Jewish people in Matthew 5 had, right? They did not have this whole beautiful, complete work yet. They had the first five books of the Bible, which was the law, and Jesus referred to it as the law and the prophets, 
And that was what they knew. That was their, that was their standard for righteous living at that time point. But something for us to know historically and in context of what we're reading here is that the law had been given a thousand years before what we're reading in this text. And so there were, there were people, Pharisees mainly, and teachers of the law who were pulling from the, from the law and pulling from what God had said, and they were sort of assembling these principles to live by and then telling people, well, this is how you should do it. But they were getting it very, very wrong. <laughs> How many of you read Matthew 23 in your homework this week? We, we saw what Jesus thought about the way that they were reassembling some of the, What they were even doing was there was practices, there was laws that only the priests needed to follow, and they were very strict. And they were taking those, and they were putting those on, on every person, whether or not you served in the temple. And they were putting these loads on the backs of the people of God. And so... Here we see Jesus, he's speaking to that. And he's saying, I, there's groups of people, there's groups of Pharisees and, and teachers of the law who are breaking the law apart. They're, they're breaking it down. I have not come to do that. I have not come to abolish the law. He's saying, I have come to fulfill it, fill it full. And we are gonna see how he does that in the, in the following passages. But he had to kind of get ahead of himself before he starts giving these, these six examples because he knew where people's minds were gonna go. He knew, he knew immediately where their minds were going to go as they're listening to him, him speak. So, um, then he says, I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so, again, we see Jesus affirming the value and the the eternal nature of the word of God. He's, he's, he's affirming, he's saying, if like, God spoke it, God decreed it, it's going to stand. Now, the way that we apply that to our lives is going to look differently. We, we saw that. If you have questions about the law and the prophets or what this Jesus is talking about here, there's a whole section of your homework called Digging Deeper that Janelle wrote, so beautifully explaining this, um, talking about how we are to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. We are not accountable to the ceremonial requirements of the law because we have Jesus, our once for all sacrifice, who came and, and gave us a, a clean, he cleansed our hearts. So we can, you can kind of dig into that a little bit on your own. Um, but I, what I wanted to do is make sure we all understand what the law is and why Jesus found it important to say, I'm not going to abolish the law. I'm going to fulfill it. All right, so... Um, and then this last verse here in the first section that we're looking at, verse 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were taking the original commands and they were twisting them. We read that in Matthew 23. I'm going to read a couple verses out of Matthew 23 because what Jesus is getting at with what they're doing is exactly what we're talking about today. So here's Matthew 23, 25 um, through 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the insides are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, First, clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Those are some very strong words from Jesus and how he feels about the way that the law was being practiced. He has a huge problem with this, and he's going to tell us in these following passages how to practice these laws rightly, how to not do what the Pharisees are doing, how to make sure the inside of the cup is clean, how to make sure that we are not full of lawlessness and dead man's bones, as he said, but that we are full of life and wholeness. And so here, here we see Jesus. He does it in this most, the most beautiful way. 
as he's, as he's saying, this, this is the wrong way to do it, but we also hear this invitation into something more and into something greater than what was, was happening in that day and in that time. And it was for them, for the people who were hearing him in that moment, and it's for us today. I want today, my, my prayer, my heart, is that you, you hear an invitation into a life of righteousness, and that that doesn't deter you or scare you or discourage you or put you off, but that you hear an invitation into a life that will be strengthened and sustained by the Holy Spirit within you, but will set you apart from the world. And that's, that's not easy. To be set apart from the world around us, to look differently, to do marriages differently, to do relationships differently, to do church differently, we have to have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, and then we have to exert our own will and take some concrete steps to make that happen. And so again, we see these, this twofold process, this cooperation, and Jesus is going to sort of detail that in the following passages. But Hear this today. If you're wrestling with this passage, if you feel like there's some tension and you're struggling with some things that you're reading here, good, good. Keep wrestling. Lean into that tension because God has something for you in this passage and most likely that thing that's pressing back against it is something in your flesh that doesn't want to be corrected and lined up with the word of God. I can tell you I had that this week when I was reading this. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. (laughs) God, are you serious? I'll tell you about that when we get there. The beauty of the word of God is it transforms our hearts and our minds and our lives. It has the power to do that in us today. So let's lean into that, all right? Amen? Amen. So, murder. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus goes through six examples of righteous living and what that looks like. We have murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and love of our enemies. And so we're going to talk through these. I'm going to spend the most time on the first one because it's a really good template that we can apply to most of the other ones is how we look at and interpret what Jesus is saying here in Scripture. Um, So at the surface level, it can appear at first that Jesus is contradicting these Old Testament laws where he, he says over and over, you have heard it said but I say to you, right? That kind of sounds like he's going to give you an alternative, right? He's not. (laughs) This helped me understand this concept a little bit. I'm a visual learner. So here we have, um, you have heard it said, you know, do not murder, right? Do not murder is this this guy right here. These are nesting dolls in case you don't know. And then what Jesus is going to do is he's going to open the law up to us. And he's going to show us a deeper wisdom and an even deeper wisdom, and an even deeper wisdom in what the original word that was spoken offered to us, okay? So maybe this will help you track, maybe it won't, but I'm very much, I need, like, I need to see what I'm learning. I can't just conceptualize things in my brain super concretely. So we're going to use these nesting dolls as our example this morning of um, the way that, that Jesus is explaining these deeper truths that we see here in the law. So you've said, you've heard that it was said to people, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. Okay, sorry. Pause really quick. I forgot to mention one more thing before we get into these. Um, Jesus often uses something called hyperbole in these examples. All right? That's just where there's this exaggerated statement that's not meant to be taken literally. And, and he's going to do that multiple times. And, it's, and I'm, I'm not trying to strip these, some of these passages of their power Um, But what what we need to understand is we need to use wisdom as we read these words of Jesus, and we need to understand that, in in fact, the reason that he's using these methods of communication is because he is so deadly serious about what he is saying. He he wants us to understand this, so he's shocking us with some words so that he's saying, pay attention right here. This is important. This is a big deal. So anyway, all that to say, I want to make sure I covered that before I jump into this portion of scripture. So, um, so we see these, these offenses that Jesus says, you have heard it said, do not murder, okay? But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother is subject to judgment. And in fact, anyone, and so this kind of anger 
if we look at the translation, it's like murderous rage, okay? This isn't just like, I'm really annoyed that my coffee order is taking a long time. This is like, I, I could put my fist through a wall, okay? So anyone who has this murderous rage against their brother, uh, they're, they're guilty of, they're gonna face judgment. Anyone who says raka, now this is a really interesting translation that we see here. Basically, raka means nothing. You nothing, empty one, right? It's, it's basically saying you're, you're worthless. You have no value. And so that's a pretty horrific thing to say to anyone. Um, I think we can agree that. And if anyone has ever said that to you, you know the weight of those words and what they have done to your life. So, so this isn't just like a, you know, a light and breezy thing. This is, this is a serious you know, offense. And then he goes on to say, and anyone who, who calls your, their brother a fool will be in danger of hellfire. So why are we seeing the offenses get apparently less and less, right? You go from murder to rage to saying something really mean to saying something just kind of mean. <laughs> and then, but the, the consequences seem to be going up in severity, right? You go from, well, you're answerable to the court, the local court, the Sanhedrin, which is like the Supreme Court, and then all of a sudden you're in danger of hellfire. And so something that we're going to see Jesus doing in each of these examples with each of these passages is he's, he's going to be using these sort of contrasting ideas. Um, and the way that I can sort of explain this, this method that Jesus is using is he wants us to get ahead and upstream of some of these, these smaller things. What did we read earlier? Anyone who teaches someone not to follow even the least of these commands. So we have Jesus here giving us some examples, we're going to see, of the least of these commands. But we see Jesus putting a high value on us being obedient to these, these small things. Um, Adam and I went to Zion National Park, it was like eight years ago, and we went hiking in this, this place called the Narrows, which is exactly what it sounds like. You're, you're walking on a riverbed, and it's sometimes ankle deep or knee deep or hip deep. Um, but either, on either side of you, it's probably maybe a, a little less wide than this room. And then each wall is just a sheer cliff, like hundreds and hundreds of feet up. And what it's, it's resulted from, you know, years and years and years of just this river cutting through these mountains. And it's beautiful, and it's insane. But... It's, it's like striking when you're in there and you're just, the only way you have to go is forward because there's just mountains on either side of you, just sheer straight up cliffs. So we get there and we're all geared up and ready to go and one of the rangers kind of gathered our group up before we went down into the actual part of the narrows where we were going to be walking and hiking and they said, hey, we need to give you fair warning. Um, there's, there's a chance of flash floods and you need to be aware of what they sound like. And you need to be listening for them. And if you hear something that sounds like a freight train, you need to get up as high as you can, as fast as you can. And I was like, come again? <laughs> Why are we here? Why are you letting people do this? Like, this is horrible. And I'm like, it's 100 degrees. We were there at the end of July. Like, it hadn't rained all week. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And I was kind of like, oh, you probably have to say this, you know, just. And he was like, no, there's, there is literally always a chance of flash floods in here. He's like, because 20 miles away in this mountain range, a cloudburst could have happened six days ago. And it could have been making its way down the mountains for the last six days. And as it's making its way down the mountains, it's gathering more water, and it's gathering trees, and it's gathering, and all of a sudden, what started as like a, a little burst out of a rain cloud is all of a sudden a flood rushing through the narrows of Zion National Park that has a devastating impact. And so when I, when I read these words of Jesus here, talking about murder and rage and, you know, calling someone worthless and then calling them an idiot, this is, this is a rain cloud, right? This is a little burst over in a mountain 20 miles away. No one really sees it, knows about it, cares about it, doesn't impact anyone, right? Until it grows, until it moves further down the mountain, gathers more water, and it becomes this. And then it becomes this. And then the next thing you know, you have, you have someone willing to commit murder because they allowed a seed 
of a sinful thought to grow in their minds. And this is what we're going to see Jesus going after in each of these passages. He's going after the root of the sin that, that no one can see, that's almost always internal, that's almost always private, and he's putting his finger on it. And he's going, this is the thing that I've come for. This is what I have come to go after. Because honestly, this can't happen if this gets cut off at the pass. And so as we look at this, I want us to sort of keep, let's keep this, this in mind. That when he talks about the least of these commandments, and it, it seems silly, right? Calling someone a fool. But what we see Jesus doing here is he's, he's saying, do you value the people around you? Do you value my sons and daughters? Because if you think you can assign someone the term idiot, what you're doing is you're putting yourself in the place of God. Because only God can assign value to us. He has called us sons and daughters. He's called us redeemed. He's called us his children. That's our identity, right? But when I try to put myself as small as it seems, right? Doesn't really, I'm, you're an idiot, okay? They deserve to be called an idiot. But what Jesus is saying is you are, you're assuming a place where you can put value on someone and then you can tell them that they're nothing. They're worthless, empty one. And then who cares if you fly into a murderous rage against them because they don't have any value, they don't mean anything in your mind. And then I don't know if, if any of you watch murder documentaries. I probably watch way too many of them. <laughs> But I always have this like question in my mind. I'm like, how does someone get to that point? Like that is, always blows my mind. I'm like, I've been mad at people. I've been really mad at people. Like I couldn't kill someone. I've never gotten to that place. But how they get there is a seed of a thought grows and that sin takes root and that rage becomes bitterness and that bitterness grows and that takes root. And then before we know it, murder happens. And it does happen unfortunately, in our very broken world. So do we see, can we, are we starting to see here what Jesus is doing? He's bringing up what seems really insignificant things. And he's saying, that's what I'm going after. Why? Because you are a people who are called to radical righteousness. You are called to look different, be different, live different, love different, interact in a different way. And you cannot do that if this stuff is hiding out in your hearts. And if your posture towards your brothers and sisters is one of, I get to decide that if you have value or not. I get to decide if you're important or not. No. Jesus came to earth assigning all of us infinite, eternal value. And that is how we are called to interact with each other and to treat each other and to talk to each other and to deal with each other. So, Jesus is brilliant and amazing. And as he's, as he's talking through this, I, I, just, I wish I could have been a fly in the wall to see people's reactions to this, this statement, right? You call someone a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. But I think they got it, right? They had much more cultural context than we did. We have to dig for this. I had to like, listen to 100 podcasts to like, actually like, start to understand what Jesus was doing here. But it's this, this beautiful invitation into something more than just not, don't commit murder, right? Congratulations if you haven't murdered someone. Good job. But if you live your whole life despising people, being contemptuous toward them, having rage against them, then according to Jesus, you missed it. You missed it. And so he's not patting you on the back for not committing murder. He's, he's inviting you into something much deeper and much more radical and something that's going to cost you something. Okay? I want us to understand this. A radically righteous life costs us something. It is not free. It wasn't free to Jesus, and it's not free to us. All right. So, I spent a lot of time on that one. We can kind of hustle our way through the, the remaining ones, because this is the... This is, this is sort of like the template, like I said, for the other ones. We can start to see what Jesus is doing. We can start to become familiar with some of his, his language here. Um, so take the smallest seed of sin captive and crush it, all right? So the next one is adultery. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her 
in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So a couple things here. When we see Jesus talking about looking at a woman in a lustful way, we do need to kind of understand the cultural context of this a little bit because, I'm sorry, you can't like live in our world right now without just seeing like boobs everywhere and people in scandalous clothing and it's just, it's all out there, right? That's just the, the culture that we're in at this moment. So this isn't just like, a, ah, they looked and they saw someone and they quick tried to turn away, but they, it's, this is like talking about someone looking at a woman with lustful intent, okay? Like, that's different than, than just this accidental glance and now I gotta deal with that. And um, this, is, this is a much deeper thing, but it's also an internal thing. And so here again, we see Jesus saying like, maybe you didn't sleep with someone else's spouse, But have you allowed lust a wrongful place in your life? Have you allowed it to take root in your heart and in your mind? And I know as women, maybe we're not as prone to visually lusting, but we still have places in our lives and in our hearts where that can take root if we let it. If we allow our minds to be captive by things they should not be captive by. If we're reading things, if we're watching things, if we're meditating and thinking on things or scenarios or situations, we are allowing lust to take root in our hearts and in our lives. And and Jesus is saying, get that out. And his words are so strong. This is where we see an example of him using hyperbole. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. (laughs) And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, where did Jesus say a man had committed adultery with a woman? In his heart, heart, right. So we know that this is not a literal command, right? Don't do this, please. (laughs) Don't ask your husband to do this, okay? This is, this is, but this, what this is Jesus saying is saying, take whatever measure you need to take to get rid of sexual sin. Do whatever you have to do to keep that out of your life. It has no place in the life of a follower of Jesus who is seeking to live a radically righteous lifestyle. And so do what you have to do. What do you need to do? Throw your romance novels away? Get rid of your HBO subscription? Get a flip phone? Oh, those seem like really extreme things. I don't know what Jesus said to cut off your hand and gouge out your eye, so I think those are sort of like measured responses compared to that, right? Like, let's let's take this seriously. Let's take this root of sin in our lives seriously. And Jesus Jesus is saying he, he does. He takes it very seriously. And then again, we see this idea of value. Do I value my brothers and my sisters in Christ to the point where they are not like like objects of lust? but that they are fellow co-laborers in the kingdom of God with me. And when we start shifting our perspective from, from one of the world, right, to one of the kingdom, we can start to see like, oh, that has no place here. It has no place here. Jesus is very serious about sexual sin because it doesn't just stay with us. It doesn't just stay private. And that's sort of the point of what he's saying here. It's going gonna, it's gonna to affect other people. It's going to leach out into the people around us. And flip that around, when we treat each other with value and when we look at each other as co-laborers and brothers and sisters, that also impacts those around us. So, all right, let's move on. Sorry. All right. So the solution to cutting off lust... Get rid of whatever you need to get rid of. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you on that. He knows, and you know, because he's going to be speaking to you and telling you about it. This is a beautiful thing about when we are looking at righteousness and when we're looking at our part that we're playing right now, okay? This is, for the record, there is a part that Christ plays in our righteousness. Right now we're talking about the part that we play. And when we submit that to God and we say, God, help me, I, I want this. I I really want to live a righteous lifestyle. He is going to answer you and he's going to show up and he's going to do incredible things in your life. So let's not fall into condemnation, but let's welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
All right, the next is divorce. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. So, here Jesus is addressing a common occurrence in the culture where there was a wrong interpretation of the law, right? There was, there was this idea, and if we, we can read back in the law and see, Moses allowed for divorce in instances of marital unfaithfulness. That's the interpretation we can pull from the law. But what the Pharisees were doing, and what they had rewritten it to, is basically a man could issue a woman a certificate of divorce for literally anything. Like, he woke up one morning, didn't like the way her hair looked, divorce. He didn't like the way she cooked her meal, he could, he could, he could cast her aside. And what we know about women in this culture is they did not have anything apart from their husbands. This is, we are in a completely different time and era as, as women, but they had nothing, all right? Their property, their homes, like their livelihood, it was all wrapped up in their husbands. And so here we see Jesus, and I just, I think this is beautiful, just kind of coming in with this protective measure over these women and saying like, stop doing that. Stop, how, like, the, you don't see the value in this woman. Like, stop casting her aside for no reason. This is ridiculous. And I just, I love, oh man, I love Jesus for so many reasons, but I love just, it just feels like a very protective verse. As he says, don't do that, that's wrong. And if you do that, you're the guilty one. You're the one who's accountable. And you're the one, like, that sin is basically on your head. So there's that. And then we see, um, oh, also, it's a very low view, obviously, of the marriage covenant. If they think that they can just issue a divorce to their wife for whatever reason, right? Jesus is, and, and Jesus is kind of going after that. Um, I wrote here, I, he's calling his people to a higher standard of righteousness in every area of their lives, specifically the areas that affect other people, um, and that absolutely impacts marriage. If, if, our, if our lives are to be radically different than the world, our marriages have to be radically different than the world. There's no getting around that. And so Jesus is saying, he, he's, he's, re, he's reminding them of the value, not just of their wives and women, but he's reminding them of the value of the marriage covenant. And why that's a big deal is because our marriage covenants They mirror the covenant that the bride, Jesus, has with Jesus, the bridegroom, right? Like our our marriages are intended, we see this in scripture over and over again, they're intended to mirror the relationship of Christ and his church. And so as we realize that, and as we start taking hold of that idea, that that does transform the way that we look at our marriages and that we do do marriage. Um, I wrote here, if... Husbands and wives understand that we bear the image of a God who says, I am your bridegroom, you are my bride. Then there is this high value on the marriage covenant. Because we see marriage, marriage is about serving, right? Dying to ourselves. It's, we, we have this example of that in Jesus. He served us, his church. He, he literally died for us. He actually rescued us. He pulled us out of darkness, brought us into light. So he's, he's our first example in that. Um, marriage is a cooperation of two people who both bear the image of God. And we, as we do life together, we sort of spur one another on in that. We see Jesus in the church doing the same thing, right? We cooperate with Christ as the church to bring his kingdom here on earth. And so Jesus is re-elevating this idea that marriage is not just like this thing that we do because we need to have company with someone, It's this thing that we do because it emulates the love of Jesus for his bride. And when we do it right, it is a sign to the world of how good it is to be in relationship with Christ. Amen? All right, so here Jesus brings that up, brings up divorce. We see see in these first three examples that he's, he's trying to get us to step back from the way that we treat other people and ask ourselves, do I, do I value my brother and my sister? Do I value those around me enough to die to my, my, my life and my preferences in some places and, and prefer them? The next three, we see oaths. 
Um, an eye for an eye, which is retaliation, and then loving our enemies. So Janelle actually did a really good job of just sort of summing up oaths and what they are. In scripture, we see an oath is a promise between two people, and they use the name of God to seal it, okay? So a vow is like me and God. I'm talking to God, and I promise I'm going to do something to God. But an oath is something between two people. So again, we see Jesus, is he cares about our interactions with one another. Um, so basically what they would do in this time is they would, they would swear by the name of God that they would give someone a camel. Okay, I'm just making this up. And they would say, yes, I swear by the name of Yahweh that I will give you, you know, this camel. And then it was sealed, and they had to do it because they were invoking the name of God to make a promise. But what happened as, as time went on is they, people wanted to start to give themselves some wiggle room to get out of their commitments and to get out of their promises. And so they would say, I swear by the temple, right? Well, I don't really swear by God. It's a God-adjacent thing. I swear by the gold of the temple. In fact, Jesus uses that as an example again in Matthew 23 when he's condemning the Pharisees and the way that they're practicing the law. And he's saying, you're swearing by the gold of the temple. What's more sacred? Like the gold or the temple that makes it sacred? And so we see this idea of are we being truthful? Are we being honest Or are we trying to manipulate things a little bit and get things just to go our way? And I'm kind of willing to say whatever I need to say to make sure I get what I want. And so here's this idea once again of, I mean, you say like swearing an oath, that doesn't really seem like that big of a deal, right? Like, but what Jesus is saying is if you're my people and if you're representing me in the world, you're representing a God whose word is eternal It's faithful and it's true. Everything God has said will come to pass. So we, as his representatives, we have a higher standard when it comes to what we say, when it comes to what we promise to do because we're representing a God who is faithful to all his promises. Now, obviously we are not perfect and we are gonna fail and we're gonna let people down. But but the idea is, as we uh, look at the end of this this saying on oaths, he said, simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Like, that's a big deal. Like, let your yes be yes or your no be no, or it comes from the evil one. How does the evil one present himself to us? Very first time we see him in Genesis. He's a liar. And he twists the words of God. And he does that in order to manipulate a situation and bring sin and bring death. And so here we, here we see what seems to be such a small thing. Like, I even almost, when I was reading oaths, I'm like, oaths, really? <laughs> what does that even mean? Like, the more I dig into it, we see the wisdom of God in these laws that, that are way back in the Old Testament. But, but God, it was always pointing to Jesus, It's always pointing to only Jesus who can make these things right in us. So, let your yes be yes and your no be no. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, I feel like these last two we can kind of lump together for the sake of time. Um, But I do want to have a couple, talk about a couple little cultural things here that are really interesting. So, for, for an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, this is, this, is, this is the idea of vengeance, right? Justice. Um, if, if, I'm, if I'm working in your field and I, you know, you run me over with your plow, I'm just trying to think of like what's happening back when this is being written, <laughs> and you break my leg, like legally I could break your leg, right? That was, that was part of the law. Now that sounds really savage until you think about our propensity to escalate situations, right? You break my leg, I break your back. And so it's like Jesus knew our propensity to do this. So he said, here's the deal. We're going to have this idea, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's just just basically like an equal thing. Now, the way that this actually played out, it wasn't like someone actually gouged out someone's eye and then they got to gouge the other person's eye out. Almost always, it was a monetary compensation, right? To like Because what's the point? If I poke out Ruthie's eye and she pokes out my eye, then we both don't have an eye. And it's, it's, 
not good. But if I accidentally poke her eye out, I can be like, I'm so sorry, here's $10,000. I hope you get a really good pair of glasses with this and <laughs> you're okay. And so we, we kind of see this, it's, it's, it's to bring, a, it's to put a cap on our natural propensity to take revenge and to escalate a situation. That's the original law. So that's what Jesus is referring to here. An eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile with him, go too. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And so, again, there's some really important cultural context in this. It's not, it's not inviting us to be a doormat for people. And it's not inviting us to let people take advantage of us. But what it's inviting us to do is to posture ourselves in such a way that that's actually impossible. To posture yourself in such a way that it's, it's safe and you're okay, but you can, you can pour out grace on this person. And you can offer them something that they probably don't deserve, right? That you don't need to get revenge and you don't need to match um, evil for evil. This is actually quoted, someone quotes Jesus in this, I think, I don't know, I think it's Paul, quotes Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and that's how he rephrases this line. Don't repay someone evil for evil. If someone is doing something horrible to you, do not do something horrible back to them. Okay? Step back. Realign your posture. You don't have to get run over. You don't have to be a doormat. Come up with a way, though, a creative way, a way that doesn't pour more evil and more gas on the situation to figure things out. And there's, there's a way we can do that. And that's when it talks about, you know, the slapping of the cheek and the cloak. It's, it's, these are actually really interesting, creative ways of people kind of standing their ground in Scripture, but also not escalating the situation and not retaliating evil with evil. And so I don't really have time to get into that right now, but if you want to do some research on your own in that direction, it's really interesting um, that we don't see Jesus inviting us to just roll over and let people do whatever they want. That's not, that's not okay. That's not how we interact with each other either, but that we are the ones who... We have a security, we know who our God is, we don't have anything to prove, and we can creatively come up with a way to stand our ground, but to also release people into the justice and the grace of God, right? So, love your enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, which that is not in the law. That is actually Jesus speaking to something that was happening in the current culture. Um, there's nowhere in the law that tells us to love our neighbor and hate our enemies. I just want to clarify that right there. Um, <clears throat> but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This part gets me. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brother, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? We'll, we'll grab that last verse in a second, but as, as people who are called to live lives of radical righteousness, we have to love the hard people. We have to have a heart posture, right? This is, this, again, so everything Jesus is talking about here, it's, it's interior. It's, it's an inner work that, that we need to, that we are responsible for. I am in a situation right now that is I, I, where I'm dealing with, with a person who is very hard to love. You don't know them, okay? I just want to put that out there. It's not anyone in this room. <laughs> Whenever someone says that, I'm like, ooh, I wonder who that is. Um, it's a totally exterior situation to anything happening at church. But I read this verse this week, and I was like, <sighs> started getting like sweaty. I'm like, God, uh, I know, I know this in my brain. It is really hard to walk this out. It is really hard to pray for someone who you're like, you're the worst. You're the worst. It's really hard to submit yourself to this word right here in obedience. But I did it. <laughs> With my teeth clenched, I did it. 
And I said, God, I see my heart is not lined up to your word in this area. I see I'm, I'm in sin toward this person because I don't want to pray for them. I don't want them to succeed. I don't want to love them. I want to just pretend that they don't exist. And I actually want to pray that their life goes really bad, if I'm being honest. <laughs> And I, I very clearly, thanks Janelle for making me teach on this passage. <laughs> I very clearly heard the Holy Spirit say to me as I was reading this, Emily, I have given you my Holy Spirit. I've put him inside you. You are different. You do not love and live as the world loves and live. You live the way I tell you to love and live. And that means you do Take those feelings and you put them to death and then you take up the nature of Christ and you pray that he would, he would do that work in you. Now, as we kind of close on these six examples, I, wanna, I do want to touch on that. I want to talk about that because I feel like it's... We talked a lot about our responsibility for living a righteous life. There is, we have to exert our wills. There is a, there is a place where I, I, have, I have to say, God, you are not going to animate me like a puppet. I wish you would sometimes. I wish you would just control me and make me. No, I have a choice. And it is, it is a worshipful act to our God. When we submit our bodies and our thoughts and our hearts and our feelings and our desires to the word of God, and we walk away that we don't feel like walking. But we do it because that's what, that's what kingdom people do. That's what people who are part of the radical kingdom do. And so I, I wrote this. Um, here, hang on. I, gotta, I already did retaliation, eye for an eye. Wow, I got to skip some <laughs> pages. Um, I wrote this. If it feels like a lot, that's because it is. This radical call to righteousness, it feels impossible. Um, because it is, except for one thing. This very, this very last verse says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Cherry on the top of just what you told me to do, because you told me, you called me to all this stuff, and now I have to be perfect. The beautiful translation of that word perfect is complete. Be complete. Be grown up. Here, I wrote it down. Um, Having reached its end, complete and perfect, complete in all its parts, full grown, um, especially of the completeness of character, going through all the necessary stages to reach the end goal. Okay. Romans 6.13, do not present your members, your body, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your body, your members, as instruments of righteousness to God. So in this place this morning, Father, we, we, we present ourselves before you as instruments of your righteousness. Not our own, but yours. And God, I pray that this word that we heard this morning, it would settle deep in our hearts. And God, we do invite your conviction into our hearts. We ask that you would speak to us, God, where we are out of alignment with what you've called us to do, the way you've called us to walk. And God, we, we ask that as we walk through our days, being salt and light, being a city on a hill, living a righteous life, God, we pray for you to get all glory, all honor, all praise, you to get all the worship, God. May our lives point to you and to you only and to you always. In your name we pray, amen.